May the Lord be with us with his grace and mercy and peace as we meditate on his holy word. Amen. Our Old Testament lesson ended with this warning. Look, the days are coming, declares the Lord God, when I will send a famine into the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but rather a famine of hearing the words of of the Lord. Hurricanes, earthquakes, tornadoes, tsunamis, all are disasters that serve as warnings of the end of the world which is approaching. There's so much devastation caused by such disasters. Last week, for example, a tsunami and earthquake hit Japan on the same day. And just a month ago, we all saw the pictures of devastation from the Bahamas, where you wonder, where do you even begin to rebuild, and will they be able to? But of all the disasters that can come on people, by far worse is the one the Lord foretells through Amos. A famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea and from north to east. They'll roam back and forth seeking the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. A tornado can destroy your home. A drought can wither your body and parch your lips. But a famine of the word of God can leave your soul lying a million, dying a million deaths in all eternity. There is no disaster that can befall a people worse than the one foretold, a famine of the word. What a blessing it is when the word of God rings out in a nation and where people gladly come to hear and learn what God has to say. There were times in Israel's history when the great majority would come in great joy to Jerusalem to worship the Lord and to hear his word. There was a time in the history of Turkey and Greece when the congregation's founded by the Apostle Paul, were flourishing and growing and spreading. In the first centuries after Christ, the word, the gospel, spread to Ethiopia and North Africa and to the Middle East and to even Southern Asia. People gladly gathered to hear the word of God. They trusted in God and they were saved for eternity. But in time, their love of the word grew cold. Faith died out until finally in judgment, the scourge of Islam destroyed what was left with the sword and converted the empty church buildings into mosques. And the word of the Lord all but disappeared. A famine of the word of God. Rome was the very center of Western Christianity. Peter preached there. St. Paul preached there. The gospel rang out. The Roman Empire fell and the church took its place proclaiming Jesus Christ crucified for our sins and raised to life again for our eternity, for our eternal life and resurrection, for our justification but that got so boring. And so the church bit by bit subtracted from the gospel and added human ideas to the word of God to the point where you could be burned at the stake in Rome for saying that you're saved by grace alone. A famine of the word. In Saxony, in Germany, the chains were finally removed from Scripture by the Reformation. Salvation was proclaimed clearly. The 
200 years still after the Reformation, there was standing room only in the churches in Leipzig when J.S. Bach used his artistic talent to proclaim the gospel in music and the people of Leipzig were petitioning the city council, please add more services. Please build another church. But within a generation, rationalism had destroyed the gospel in Saxony. We can't trust God's word. We don't want to hear God's word. Give us lectures on proper gardening techniques instead. Today, those churches are mostly empty on Sunday morning. They fill up on weeknights at times for concerts. Some of them are museums. Many of them have crumbled and simply blown away. A famine of the word of God. And what about America today? Rarely in the annals of history has a country been de-Christianized to such a huge extent and so rapidly as America. Morals are in free fall. Ethics have gone out the window. The American family has broken down. God speaks and people yawn with indifference. People gladly exchange the pure gospel for churches that entertain or for Sunday morning sitting at home with a newspaper and coffee or for youth sport leagues for their kids because repentance and forgiveness of sins, eternal life, that is so yesterday and passé. And God's warning remains. Look, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine into the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but rather a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. People will stumble from sea to sea and from north to east. They will roam back and forth seeking the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. There is no worse judgment than that God acquiesces to people's demands to just leave me alone. It's been said that there are only two kinds of people in the world. Believers who say, Lord, thy will be done. And those to whom finally God must say, all right, you don't want me around. You don't want to hear my word. I've tried and I've tried, but okay, thy will be done. I'll stop bothering you. I'll stop offering you forgiveness, life, and salvation. And so the churches close and the gospel moves on to another land. What is it that finally causes God to withdraw his word? Well, what was the cause of the coming famine that Amos foretold? The same thing. Israel was bored with the word of the Lord. Yes, many of them still went through the motions. They had to. Everything was closed on Saturday. They had to, to show themselves to be outwardly pious people. So they went to synagogue. They went to the temple. They went through the motions the whole time looking at their sundials and saying when is this going to end? I can't wait to get back to the market and sell stuff and make money. Man, if that doesn't sound just like America today, I don't know what does. Instead of listening to God's word and putting it into practice, they mumbled under their breath when will these blue laws go away? God doesn't matter. People don't matter. Just the almighty shekel. Their lives reflected their lack of faith. They were self-centered. They were unsanctified. Their lives were filled with 
cheating because money and things became more important than not only God but also people. And that's what happens when we yawn at the word of God. Those who love God also love their neighbor. But look at Israel. You trample on the needy to wipe out the oppressed from the land. You say, when will the new moon be over so that we can sell grain? When will the Sabbath end so that we can open the grain bins? Then we'll make the bushel smaller and make the shekel weight heavier. We will cheat with dishonest scales. We'll buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. We'll sell the chaff with the grain. For the gospel is more and more ignored. Pure materialism takes over. Where Christ is no longer known, people no longer see Christ in their neighbor. Israel was actually quite prosperous in Amos' day. At least the rich were getting richer, looking after themselves and their needs. That was their top priority, their golden calf, their idol. God and their poor neighbor, <laughs> whatever. Well, we're pretty prosperous too, aren't we? In fact, we live in a level of comfort unknown at any time in the history of the world and far greater than almost every nation today. How could it not be that we Christians also would be sorely tempted every day to be caught up in this earthly materialism ourselves. We're all pretty good at noticing that problem in others. Yeah, there are some people out there that cheat. I'm glad I'm not one of them. But it's harder for us to look into our own hearts and say, is God really number one in my life? Do I show it by how I act as a manager or a steward of the things that God has given me? We need to ask ourselves those questions. Remember that story that Jesus told of the rich man and Lazarus? You can probably imagine how that rich man thought as he saw Lazarus way, way, way down the sidewalk at the end there begging for crumbs. Whatever. He's probably in that circumstance because of something he did wrong. He probably doesn't work as hard as me, says the guy whose hardest work is lifting up the drumstick to his mouth at the big table. Remember what happened to that rich guy when he died? Then he wasn't too comfortable anymore. Then he found out what a real famine is like as he longed for one single drop of water to be put on the tip of his tongue in hell. So take note of the causes of the famine of the word outlined by the prophet. Going through the motions, false and hypocritical worship, rather than listening to the word of God and applying it to their lives. People were chomping at the bit, looking at their sundials, wondering when it all would end so that they could get back to unbridled materialism. That's the cause. And the effect? Because of this, the land will shake, and everyone living in it will mourn. The whole land will rise up like the Nile. It will surge and sink down again like the Nile of Egypt. On that day, I will make the sun set at noon, and I will bring darkness on the earth when it should be light. I will turn your festivals into mourning and your songs into a lamentation. Before Amos finished speaking, there was a solar eclipse that hid the sun at noon. And two years after Amos predicted it, the land shook massively with an earthquake. It rose and fell like the Nile. God sent these events to confirm Amos as a true prophet. 
But more than that, God uses these things. He uses disasters. He uses earthquakes. He uses even eclipses to give us a glimpse of what will come on a massive scale on the great day of the Lord. The solid ground under Israel's government would soon give way. The ten northern tribes would forever thereafter be known as the ten lost tribes, scattered to the four winds. Those who ignore God's word will be judged by his word. Those who forego God's forgiveness will see the sun of righteousness set. How dark the picture becomes when men forsake their God. Those who tell God, get lost, eventually get their wish. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will send a famine into the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but rather a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. The famine came. The famine is still spreading today. Those small oases in the desert where one can find the water of life are drying up. In wells, they keep saying at the current trend that it's going to go from 1,300 congregations to 300 in the next 40 years unless something changes. The oases with the living water are drying up one by one. By God's grace, his grace is still proclaimed among us in its truth and purity now 90 years on. How are we going to keep it? By using what we've got, by listening to the word, by taking it to heart, by putting it into practice in our lives. Most of all, by treasuring the gospel of free and full forgiveness in Jesus. It's a tragedy of unspeakable proportions when someone grows bored with the message of forgiveness in Jesus' blood. Fools travel the world looking for more exciting messages. Think Richard Gere looking for a guru in India. They travel the world looking for messages that offer nothing. No peace, no forgiveness, no assurance, no eternal life. Isaiah asked, Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Amos offered frightening warnings, true warnings, warnings that must be heeded. Yet Amos also offered hope and mercy. For those who still believed and longed for the salvation promised in the Messiah, the Lord inspired Amos to end his book with this promise. I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places. I will restore its ruins and build it as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. May we, at dear old faith Lutheran of Carthage, always be among those who bear the name of the Lord by hearing, believing, and living the gospel. And may we never grow tired of the message of Christ crucified for me and risen. Amen.